Hey Grace family, we just want to let you know how much we really appreciate and love you guys. Uh, right now we are trying to figure out what our interpreting ministry looks like going forward. So if you don't mind, we would love your help. We want to know if you've used this service and how you use it. Do you watch online? Do you come in person? Do you watch it later in the week? Which one do you do? And if you don't mind, if you could please just let us know by filling out the, the survey with the QR code that's provided at the side of the screen. Once that pops up, go ahead and fill that out and that'll give us the answers we need for us to figure out what this ministry looks like going forward. Again, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Amen. Amen, guys. Thanks for praying with me. Um, okay, so we are in Habakkuk week two. Can you say Habakkuk? Try. Habakkuk. Habakkuk nice try. Um, Habakkuk, Habakkuk. There's lots of different ways to say the word. None of it matters. We're just going to read Habakkuk. Amen. Um, and we started last week and we started in chapter one last week. It's a, a tiny little three chapter book. And part of what we covered was that Habakkuk was this Old Testament prophet. Small book many of us haven't even read before, but in Habakkuk, in that first chapter, God gives a message to Habakkuk, and Habakkuk prays to God. And one of the things Habakkuk was dealing with at that time, if you remember last week, is that his nation, which was called Judah, it was the southern kingdom of Israel, after a civil war, all that historical stuff I'm not going to get into today, but Judah was moving away from God. They had let sin and corruption take over. Violence was taking over in their culture. And Habakkuk the prophet goes to God and he prays and he pleads to God to come and deal with his people. But one of the things we said last week is that we expect Habakkuk actually had some things in mind, like maybe a subtle little regime change. Maybe that would deal with the problem. Or maybe a spiritual revival would sweep the nation and that would bring people back to God. But the answer that he actually got from God was that God was going to deal with the nation, but he was going to do it by bringing a foreign nation called Babylon in with its army to overtake and defeat Judah. So it's like if you were asking for revival in America, in the churches of America, and God said, sure, I'll bring judgment and Russia is going to invade, that would be bad news for you. And that's similar to what God is doing here. He's saying, I do have a plan but it's a harsh plan. And it's one of those days and Habakkuk struggles with it. And so he says this in response to God. I want you to see this on your screens. It's Habakkuk 1.12. He says, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God? It's almost like he's saying, God, I thought you were eternal. Like this is confusing to me. But he says, O Lord, my God, my Holy One. There's still words of love and covenant there. We shall not die. His confidence, O Lord, you have ordained them. He means Babylon there as a judgment and you, O rock, have established them as a reproof. And in that one verse, he kind of says it all in perfect balance. This is a great prayer from the prophet. He says, God, I'm struggling with this. I know you're bringing judgment that you think is right. And I believe by faith that at the end of the day, this isn't going to ultimately destroy us. It might be a season of difficulty, but it's not going to ultimately destroy us. So, so what we took away from last week is, is that this kind of mixture of a prayer, which is just so perfect, is this honesty plus faith together when you talk to God. Does that make sense? It's honesty and faith. And sometimes as Christians, we struggle to bring that kind of balance to God. So let's keep looking at his prayer because I only gave you the first part last week. I'm going to give you the rest of his prayer. So this is verse 13. He says, but you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil, God. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? So there's two big points here. First off, he says, how can God use evil and use evil people to accomplish his good purpose? And he's wrestling with the idea that if God uses an evil group of people to accomplish his purpose... Does that mean he's endorsing them? No, he's not. And God's going to give an answer to that. So he's struggling. We would struggle as well. But the second piece, notice, he says, God, would you let a group of people come in and defeat your chosen people? God, we're the religious Christians here. You're going to let some pagans come in and take us out? Because we're more righteous than they are, God. Does anybody see a biblical problem with that statement? 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even in the book of James, it says, if you would come to God's law and his ways, and if you would fail at just one part of it, you're guilty of breaking the whole law. And there are all these truths that come to scripture um, at us that, that, that say we're not really on good footing when we're trying to compare our goodness with the goodness of other human beings. We're kind of on a level playing field. We're kind of all sinners at the foot of the cross. Can I get a better amen? amen. Yes. And so God is going to deal with this in just a minute because what he's doing there by comparing his righteousness to the righteousness of others is kind of self-focused and it's kind of prideful. There's some arrogance in it. God's going to deal with it in just a minute. So here's the rest of his prayer. Will you let them get away with this forever, God? Will they succeed forever in their heartless conquest? This is Babylon. I will climb to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer my complaint. So, so the prophet is like, number one, okay, even if this has to happen, God, are they gonna succeed forever? Will evil ultimately win? So that's a big question. God's gonna answer that one. And then he says, I'm gonna go up on my watchtower kind of symbolically, and I'm gonna wait for God's answer. I love this. If you're reading Habakkuk as a, a kind of a guideline or, or, or wisdom book on how to pray to God, this is a really important point. Sometimes we pray and we don't wait for the answer. Sometimes we pray and we just move on. And in our very quick moving on, after we've asked God for something, it betrays a lack of faith in us that we don't expect God to answer. So Habakkuk stops and he's like, I asked, I'm waiting. That faith, that expectation is so strong, so helpful for us. Here comes God's reply, verse two. Then the Lord said to me, write my answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently for it will surely take place it will not be delayed. So, so number one, in this passage, God says, write it down, Habakkuk. Everything that's going on between the two of us, I want you to write it down. So if you wonder why in the world we've got this book called Habakkuk with three chapters of this guy's prayer life, why was that preserved? Because God told him to. God said, write this thing down because this conversation is gonna bless future generations. And then God says, the ultimate judgment of Babylon is coming. And then he's going to describe that more in the next spot. God replies, this is uh, verse four. Look at the proud, he says. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked, but the, righteousness, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. This verse right here is one of the most theologically and gospel important verses in all of scripture. The apostle Paul actually quotes this exact verse at least three times in the New Testament when he's trying to explain to people how we're saved by faith alone. He goes to this verse. And in this verse, God takes two concepts that you would not normally put together and God puts them together. He says there's pride on the one hand and there's faith on the other. Pride on the one hand and there's faith on the other. I, I, I thought it would be faith and doubt, God. Oh no, it's pride and faith. Why? Because pride is all about I'm the center of the universe. Pride is all about the fact that I rely on me. Pride is about the fact that I'm going to save me through my efforts. I'm going to climb the mountain and I'm going to get back to God all on my own. All that self-reliance, all that self-centeredness. See, faith is about God-centeredness. Faith is about God-reliance. Faith is about Jesus' salvation that you can't find for yourself alone. So, so to reject pride is to embrace faith in the only person who can save me because I can't save myself. Verse five, he says, wealth is treacherous and the arrogant are never at rest. Now here's him going to describe Babylon. They open their mouths as wide as the grave and like death, they are never satisfied. In their greed, they have gathered up many nations and they have swallowed many peoples. But soon, their captives will taunt them. So here's his answer. Is he said, don't get so worried, Habakkuk, about Babylon. Babylon is going to be taken over by somebody even more evil than itself. 
there's going to come a day Babylon's captors are going to revolt and come against them. They will mock them saying, what sorrow awaits you thieves? Now you will get what you deserve. Verse seven, suddenly your debtors will take action against you. They will turn on you and they will take all that you have. So God says, just give it time because there's always a bigger fish. And today Babylon's the big fish, but another one's going to come along and gobble them up. And so will be done the justice of God. One nation will take over another and take over another and take over another till the end of time, literally. So let me show you this cycle of evil, just a a little bit of a taste of it. See, Assyria was the ones that they had originally attacked the Northern kingdom, which was Israel. And then Babylon came along and historically they judged Assyria. And then after they judged Assyria, then they came and they took over Judah, which happens after the book of Habakkuk is over. Then Persia comes along and they judge Babylon. Greece is going to judge Persia and Rome will eventually judge Greece. Do you see how there's always a bigger fish? This is the way that it works. God says there is a cycle of evil governments and evil systems that will not stop until the very end of time. And God will utilize that cycle for his purposes, for his justice. Isn't this a happy Father's Day message? <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, crazy, crazy. So let's, let's get even darker here. Um, because it's fun. Um, In the rest of the passage, God goes into great uh, kind of poetic depth in trying to describe what the essence of this Babylon system is actually like. So so I've I've listed it out for you. In verse five, he talks about slavery and oppression because that's what the powerful always do is they always use their power to put other people down because the more I can abuse other people and use other people, the higher I get, the more comfortable I get, the more secure I get. This is the way that it works, right? Lion King coming in. Oh, it's a beautiful circle of life. No, it's not. I mean, you can look at it that way if you want to, but this broken system broken since the fall and the first sin is a dark place to be. It just is because we tend to eat each other in the human race. So that's slavery and oppression, verse five. Next is theft and extortion. Extortion is using whatever power you have in order to to steal and take from other people because as soon as you get power, as soon as you get money, what do you want? You want more of it. You have to have more. Debt bondage is described in verse seven. This is when you come in and you use interest rates and you use debt in order to entrap people. Not to kindly let somebody get past a speed bump in their life. Instead, you use giving them money via debt in order to entrap them for as long as humanly possible to squeeze every drop of financial blood out of them that you possibly can. Does any of this sound familiar? Next is more violence. Building bigger houses, that's a funny one. Building bigger houses. Why, why do they build the bigger houses? Actually, if you look at the verse, it says they build bigger houses because they want to feel more and more safe. And as soon as you built a big house, you need a bigger house to feel even more safe. Or you could say 401k if you would like. And then God says, you're oppressing so many people and you're trapping so many people in debt so you can get bigger and bigger homes. And he says, the stones of the walls that are protecting you are crying out to me for your judgment. And then you've got corruption because as soon as these wealthy, powerful people get into power and they get into positions of power, they, they bring corruption in. Making people drunk is such, a, such an interesting one. He says, you give a cup of wine to people. You force a cup of wine to people so that you can laugh at their nakedness. Because what? Because you're trying to ensnare people into addiction purposefully for their shame and for their bondage. Because once you have people addicted, they're easier to control. It's just true. So how many different systems, even in our culture today, guys, are trying to entrap people financially. They're trying to entrap people sexually. They're trying to entrap people with all, because they're easier to control. And we get to laugh at their shame and their nakedness. Then it says, they're cutting down forests and destroying animals. And then God becomes a tree hugger all of a sudden. What are we talking about here? 
He says, you, you cut down all the forests of Lebanon. There's, there's this, this picture he paints of just total waste, just going and, and removing everything from, 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 from the garden, from, the, from, from nature that we were supposed to cultivate and protect from early on. We were supposed to take care of it, not decimate it. And God says, you're decimating it. And why are you, because de- you can you're just doing what you want to because you can. He says, killing the wild animals. You know, there, there, there's something for taking what you need, but there's going too far. And then finally, he says, their faith is in their idols. And you're like, well, I don't, I don't have a little statue that I worship. Oh, don't you? Because the same way they were, we do it today. Is we worship things like wealth and power, and sex, and reputation, and education, and title, and on and on it goes. We worship those things. Well, I don't bow down and sing songs to those things. I get it. But whatever altar you're sacrificing the things you love at, that thing is your God. If you're willing to sacrifice your marriage over other sexual temptation... Do you realize you're sacrificing that at the altar of sexual immorality? You're giving it all your power and the worship changes you. Some of you go to the altar of career and you sacrifice time with your family and influence with your kids. You sacrifice it there in order to have the kind of career that your inner need demands. It's like, I'm willing to compromise what I love. I'm willing to compromise what I say are my priorities. I'm willing to compromise the way and the will of God. On this, that's your God then. And it changes you because you are what you eat. It changes you. And you've seen it before. It's just a different way of talking about it. But the more and more you give to these destructive things, the more that they pull you in and they capture you and they enslave you. We find ourselves, even as Christians, worshiping the wrong things all the time. And then verse 13, has not the Lord of heaven's armies promised that the wealth of nations will turn to ashes? They work so hard, but all in vain. For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of the Lord. Now he says, the wealth of nations will turn to ashes. So he's given us a picture of his final judgment against Babylon. But when he says all nations, it's like he changed the subject here for a second. Wait a second, I thought we were talking about this one nation. He says, no, this prophecy is about ultimate Babylon. This prophecy is about the whole system, no matter what time and place you are in. Babylon is always there. And he says, and Babylon will be judged. Babylon will be judged. So on that cheery note, happy Father's Day. And, and this, this is um, a, a darker message, so we definitely need a bacon break. Can I get an amen? We definitely need a break for bacon. So our ushers are coming over right now. And they're, at, they're literally, if, if you're new with us, uh, they're literally pa- passing trays of bacon. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And um, it's always a bit of a game to see whether or not the pastor chokes on stage. Um, So we're going to get these passing. But as they pass uh, down through the room and you get some, here comes the music. Thank God. So good. As they pass it down, I will just say, uh, based on previous year's experience, some of you are greater bacon lovers than others. And when the tray comes to you, you want to get really choosy about making sure you get the thickest and best piece. Please choose fast and move it down because I've got more preaching to do. Ladies, you are welcome to some as well. (laughs) It's good. Mm. If If you see Amanda Young later, give her a hug. She cooked all the bacon for us. Right on, right on. Oh, we're not even halfway yet, guys. Come on. (laughs) It's my favorite part of Father's Day right here. So, so good. (laughs) 
doesn't it just make all that talk of judgment just a little bit easier to take? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> and I'm so sorry, online folks, just so sorry. <laughs> I pray you have some bacon today. <laughs> It's not too late to come to third service, I promise. There will be bacon. <laughs> also, if you brought the family today, we'll talk about it later, but there's a photo booth downstairs underneath the uh, patio, and it's a beautiful one this year. Usually there's plenty of room to get the whole family kind of gathering in, take a great picture, make a great memory. Um, cornhole down there as well. Okay. I think I'm going to take us back. Thank you, Jose. All right. I think we're dealing with the last section. Just a few more slices. No rush. Okay. Everybody chewing? Y'all good? Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Yeah, that, that, was, that was like bacon ago, right? Like Habakkuk. Let's come back. Um, Habakkuk has been clear in this morning's message so far. That Babylon isn't just Babylon. Babylon's bigger. And God's going to bring judgment against Babylon. And if you're listening really, really closely, and if the Holy Spirit is whispering in your, your ear, then already there's aspects of Babylon, as I described it, where you're like, that sounds a little bit like my world. That sounds a little bit like my country. That sounds a little bit like my culture, like my community, even like my life. Just a bit. And if the Holy Spirit is starting to speak that stuff to you and you're hearing him, then you're hearing right because that's what I hear as well. Now, God says he's ultimately gonna bring judgment. And that got me thinking about the end of time. And if you know the scripture, you know Revelation is a book at the very end of the Bible that talks about the end of time. And I went looking at Revelation, you know what I found? I found in chapter 17 and chapter 18, both of those chapters are 100% devoted to a city named Babylon. And it's right in the middle of God's judgment. God's bringing judgment against the whole world for all the evils of the world. And all of a sudden you land on chapter 17 and God starts talking about this great city called Babylon. And in this great city called Babylon, I'm going to give you uh, chapter 18, verse 1. He says, After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. So God comes in and says, ultimately, there is a judgment against this evil system. Someday. Even in the, the passage in verse 10, it says in a single hour, it's destroyed. God's judgment falls. Smoke rises. See it in your mind's eye for just a moment. And can we go back to that verse really quick? Did you see how he described it? The three ways in verse three, he says, the nations have taken part in her sexual immorality. Just insert in your mind for a second, every single thing about uh, our passions, our, our luxuries, our, our, our sexual perversions, everything that we want. We want all the things that we want to ride all the rides, amen? And he says, that's Babylon. And then he comes in and he says, even the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. Now he's bringing the government in. And he's saying, it's even your officials that are taking part in all of this and being polluted by all this. Again, is it sounding familiar yet? And then finally he says, the merchants of the earth. Now here comes the economy. Here comes capitalism. Here comes, here comes everybody that's doing anything with money and business. They're all wrapped up in all of it. He said, it's all become evil. It's big stuff, the ultimate judgment. And then verse 11, it says, and then the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her 
since no one buys their cargo anymore. See, Babylon's just been destroyed and the merchants are sad because they liked going here and getting the stuff, and riding the rides. They can't get their cargo, cargo of gold, silver. Read this, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk. There's even more. And I jump ahead to wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves. That is human souls. That's in your Bible. What's he saying? He's saying, what's Babylon built on? It's all the stuff. But at the end of the day, you know how we get all the stuff? We oppress people. Slaves, that is human souls. At the very end of the list, he says, you know how you got here, wealthy people? By pushing poor people down. Ooh, and I know this could sound political. I'm not going to be political. I'm just going to tell you, God's against that. God's against human slavery in all its forms. And you know why he's against it? He says it right there. It's not just slavery of people. It's slavery of human souls, souls made in the image of God who have value and dignity from the very beginning because he gave it to them. And here he is in Revelation 18 saying, how dare you? You know, tomorrow is Juneteenth. Someone said that online. I had to go look it up. But we had the Emancipation Proclamation of Slaves in America, and we had the amendment, and then we had certain states that were slow to recognize it. And when the final state recognized it, they celebrated it as Juneteenth, which is tomorrow. Even in our country, we have built things and we have made people wealthy on the backs of other people who we oppressed. This, this is Babylon. And then God says something else. Look at verse four. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities or her sins. Now, leave that up for just a second. I want you to see something. Notice how it says, another voice from heaven. So if you remember, just a minute ago, the part we read was a mighty angel had said, fallen is Babylon. Do you remember that part? So this mighty angel had announced it, and he, he had glory and all this kind of stuff. But this mighty voice, he had said this. And in the midst of this whole thing, all of a sudden, another voice pipes in. And what does the voice say? Come out of her, my people. That's covenant language. Remember what we said last week about covenant language? Use pronouns like that, my people. You can only do that in covenant. I can say that's my Linda in the front row, even though she's not there right now. I can, oh, there she's back there. I can say it's my Linda, but you can't say that's my Linda because you're not in covenant with her, right? Like that might get uncomfortable. Amen. Amen. And she can say, my Josh, because we're in covenant together. So all of a sudden, this voice, this uh, another voice comes in and says, come out of her, my people. Who's calling us my people? It's God himself. He says, come out of her, my people. And then he says, don't take part in her sins. Notice the one, two here. Don't take part in her sins or else you'll also experience her plagues. How many of us are taking part in her sins? And we are also quietly, every single day of our lives, experiencing the plagues and the consequences that come from our involvement in Babylon. See, this is the point of today's message. You might look at this whole thing and say, man, did we just, did we just really draw a bad Sunday to go to church? <laughs> I mean, the baking was great, but we talked a whole lot about judgment and what's the point except that we all get depressed about the, God, the fact that God has to bring consequences and judgment sometimes? What's the point of all this? The point is right there in that verse. Come out of her. You need to leave. You need to get out. You're, you're in there. Do you, do you see what God's assuming? He's looking at Babylon. He's like, I'm about to bring fire in a single hour. She's going to be destroyed. Please leave. It's a warning from the scripture to us. 
Because too many of us have got our fingers and we've got our finances and we've got our, our schedule in Babylon. Hopefully that messes with you just a little bit in the right way today. See, here's what our culture says. Our culture tells you this lie every single day. It says that God has no business telling you what to do with your business. It says God has no business telling you what to do in your bedroom sexually. That God has no business of getting his fingers into your career. Scripture says differently. God has an opinion and he will bring consequence. But how dare he bring consequence? Oh no, he'll bring consequence. He says it multiple times in his word, consequence is coming. How dare he judge? He's the only one who can judge and he will judge. And that's his word. And how dare he hold me responsible? He will hold us responsible for the choices that we make. Because I don't, I don't care what the philosophers say about right and wrong and there being no right and wrong. There is right and wrong. And we're responsible for our choices. So the clock is ticking, guys. Babylon will go down in an hour. So what's your relationship to Babylon? What's your relationship to this world? Are you part of it? Like you might be in it, but are you part of it? Like I, I've told this part of my story before, my own story. I shared this two weeks ago at Growth Track because I always do, always share my testimony. But I grew up in the church. I grew up knowing the Bible really well. I grew up running the sound system on Sunday mornings at all the church cantatas. I did it all. And then I was getting drunk on Saturday nights. And it wasn't about the alcohol, guys. It was, it was about the fact that I was using people. I was a people pleaser, but I was a people user. And I didn't care about people at the end of the day. I certainly didn't care about what God wanted for my life. I knew what God's will was. It was taught to me every single Sunday. I could recite it to you, but I wasn't doing it. And the reason I wasn't doing it is because at the end of the day, it didn't bother my heart to walk in a direction that was opposite from God. It just didn't bother me. I was actually in Babylon. I was part of it. Does that make sense? I was so religious and I was so in church and I didn't know it, but I was part of that system. And judgment was coming for me and Jesus saved me. Reach out to him. Leave Babylon. You got to leave. And some of you, maybe you're not a part of it. Maybe, maybe Jesus has saved you and the Holy Spirit has finally come in and started convicting you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, which is how you know that you actually are saved because the conviction is with you and it bothers you right down to the ground. You can't just live in rebellion against God without it driving you mad. But if that change has happened in you, are you still in it? Are you still you got your fingers and stuff. And man, you're, you are experiencing the consequences every single day of those choices. And you, some people come to me as a pastor and they're like, I don't know why all this pain and all this stuff is in my life. And it's like, because of your choices, it is. I'm not a good counselor. <laughs> we have to be careful. Sometimes God is sending his quiet judgments into your life every single day and it might sound terrible, but it's actually his grace because he's trying to wake you up. He's trying to give you, he's trying to give you the progress reports before you get to the true report card. You know what I'm saying? Where's Jesus in all this? Thank God we're gonna talk about Jesus. John 17. I gotta tell you about this. Where's Jesus in all this? So Jesus has this moment right before he goes to the cross and he prays what's called the high priestly prayer. And it just means he prayed for the church of all time. And he has this moment and he's, he's just asking God the Father to do things for the church. And don't miss this. And I know people are moving around the back of the room, but don't miss this. Don't, don't lose this because this is the important spot. John 17, 14, he says, I have given them, Father, your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world. Do you see Babylon there? He's like, they're in it, but they don't belong to it. Just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, Father, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. 
Teach them your word, which is the truth. So Jesus wakes us up. He's, he's not asking us to travel off to some kind of commune in the desert, live on all natural foods, you know? It's not what he's, he's like, you got to be in the world. I get it physically, but you don't have to belong to it. It says in another place in scripture, friendship with the world is enmity toward God. It's being God's enemy. You can't be friends of both. You can't be partners with both. You can't be loyal to both. What are you loyal to? Jesus stood against this evil system in every possible way. There was a story hit me this morning and I just saw the whole thing differently when watching it through this lens. And some of you know this, maybe you heard it in Sunday school, but there's this, there's this spot where a rich young ruler comes and talks to Jesus. And he has this conversation and says, Jesus had compassion on him. And, and, and the guy asked Jesus this question. He said, what do I have to do to get eternal life? And Jesus said, you got to sell everything that you have and you got to give it to the poor. And he said, and then come follow me. Here's the thing. Maybe you've heard that a hundred times. Do you know what Jesus didn't say? Because I don't think you've noticed this. He didn't say, go sell everything that you have and give it to my movement and then we'll go. Because guys, if you'd have taken Jesus out and put in some of these te televangelists into his place, you know what they would have said? Give it to me. Now do you see it? See, so that's Jesus. Jesus says, sell it and give it to somebody else. Then come follow me. Why? Because the people of this world see a rich young ruler and they see a potential slave. Come on into my movement. Jesus saw someone who was already enslaved by his own money and he wanted to set him free. And that's the way Jesus works. Jesus didn't come today to take from you. He came to set you free because he knows the truth of Babylon, guys. He knows the truth that all of us that are in it, we are already slaves. And he's got things to give to you. So think again about Jesus. He wasn't trying to accumulate big bank accounts. The guy was homeless. Did you know your savior was homeless? Why? Because he knew he had to be out. I'm not saying you've got to be homeless today. That's not the point. But our Savior, our Lord had to set a maximum example. He says, foxes have dens, birds of the air have nests. The, the Son of Man has got no place to lay his head. Why? Because I don't have a house and I don't need to go, go to Ikea to buy stuff to furnish the house because I don't have a house. I don't have a lawn to mow, so I'm not mowing the lawn. I'm just serving the Lord and I'm not trying to accumulate a bigger and bigger house. I don't even have one. Some of you need to hear today, you need to give away some of your 401k and let it shrink to be generous to people who are in need. And I know that's nuts to say out loud, but will you be free? Jesus didn't have a sexual partner. There was no, absolutely no questions about whether or not he was taking advantage of anybody for his own pleasure or trying to possess them or any of it. He just removed himself from all of it. Praise God, our Lord. Praise God. He did not take a political position. He did not go to Rome, the center of society at that time, and start himself a massive movement with influencers and let them come in with their bribes. He didn't do any of it. He's the anti-Babylon. He's the homeless savior. See, what, what is ultimately going to change you is just what he said in John 17. You got to start reading his word because you got to get reacquainted with who he actually is because he's the anti-Babylon. And the more you appreciate him, the more you worship him like you've never worshiped him before, you're going to start letting his character come into your character. You're going to start letting his power come into your life. And it's going to set you free. Why don't you guys stand? Happy Father's Day. 
Amen. Oh, Holy Spirit, come and teach us. Holy Spirit, it, they're, they're only truths and ideas and until you connect them right, right into our life, God. You've got you've to connect them to us. So Lord, would you connect them to us right now? Would you help us to have a better vision of you? Would you open our eyes to this world that we're swimming in every single day? Lord, we love you. Set us free. In Christ's name, amen.